this is where everything just works. Yeah. Not, not quite. One of the things I've noticed as I'm getting older is my eyes are not as good. All right, so how's my audio going back there? Is that all good? Can everyone hear me just fine? Okay, um, my name is Clinton Roy. Um, I am not from the glam industries at all, uh, but I do do a fair amount of volunteer work with them. So, so this talk is kind of a bit of a journey talk. Um, I apologise for that. Um, and the point of the talk is to see where my software engineering skills and the glam industries um, intersect and meet and to see how we might progress both um, further in the future. Um, so we've sort of got four parts to the talk. I'm going to discuss who I am um, because I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not from the glam industries, so I think it's important to uh, ground everyone in exactly where I'm coming from. Um, I'm going to describe uh, software carpentry, uh, which is a very firm, um, solid foundation for this work. Then I'm going to talk about library carpentry, which is a nascent offshoot of uh, software carpentry. And then I'm going to look further into the future about what something like glam carpentry might become. Um, so we have plenty of time today. So if I start to use any technology gobbledygook terms, um, please uh, stop me and get me to um, explain myself. Um, and we don't have a question microphone today, so make sure that I repeat the question as well for everyone else. Um, so my name is Clinton Roy. I'm a software engineer from Brisbane. Um, I'm very lucky throughout my professional career to be working with open source software almost exclusively. Um, I either build stuff on top of open source software or I actually contribute to open source software for work. Um, most of my career, all up until my current job, which I've had for admittedly seven years now, um, have been working with research institutes. So CSIRO, different universities, CRC centres, ARC centres. If there's a government funded acronym, I've probably worked for them. <laughs> um, and my role in all of those is essentially the same. I am providing professional engineering services to researchers. Um, and those researchers are across a wide variety of fields. Um, squishy biology stuff, uh, linguistics, research discovery, networking, theoretical physics, robotics, automation. So quite a wide array of fields and only some of those do I natively have any expertise in. Um, uh, half of those, three quarters of those, I can sort of look at the universe of discourse that the researchers are uh, communicating in, and I can understand some of the words that they're using, but I don't really understand what's going on. But that doesn't mean that I'm not providing useful support services to them. Um, so in a lot of those roles, I was essentially doing the same thing over and over again. There were uh, it, it sort of doesn't matter what research you're doing these days. If you're doing anything at scale, you're using a lot of data sets, you're generating a lot of data, and like, particularly true for biology these days, or chemistry or physics, you're generating a lot of data, you have to computerize it, you have to use computers to help analyze that data, uh, produce research results and produce research papers on top of that. So it almost doesn't matter what you're doing, you are going to have to deal with software engineering problems at some level. And essentially what I found is that across my career, regardless of which research institutes I was working for, 
I was essentially plugging the same gaps time and time again. Um, so there was a, um, a curation problem. So they, everyone has written, all the researchers had hired some undergrads or some um, graduate students to write some code for them to make a problem go away. And that graduate student had moved on and they had this program that worked, but they needed to do something new with it. And so they'd get another graduate student to add a feature onto it. And that new graduate student couldn't make head or tail of the old program, so they'd throw that away and write a brand new one. And this would just happen again and again and again. So there was a, a complete lack of continuity. There was a loss of knowledge. They had the artifact, but they had no context around that artifact. So they had the program, but they had no documentation. They had no history behind it. They had no, uh, they had no documentation of uh, philosophy. Uh, behind it, so they didn't understand what the program was trying to do. Um, so a lot of the work that I was doing was setting up ways to store the context around the programs and the artefacts that they were creating so that all of that knowledge that the graduate students were creating would not be lost and they could, the research organisation could move forward. Um, so, so that's definitely my, my professional career as a software engineer. Um, on my personal um, life journey, um, I have been involved with libraries from a very young age. Um, you'll notice the capitalization I've done with GLAM there might hint at what part of GLAM that I'm mostly associated with. <laughs> um, so I do a lot of uh, volunteer work with the Brisbane City Council Libraries. Um, the main thing that I do there is uh, there is a worldwide project called Coda Dojo, and this is where we basically have um, after hours classes for children and teaching them the basics of programming. And um, there, there, is a, um, there is a defined set of classes for Coda Dojo, but the way the Brisbane City Council runs them is pretty much the uh, groups who are running the classes in the individual libraries get to decide what the kids do. So we have core classes in a graphical programming language called Scratch, um, which is very popular and it's a great introductory language. Uh, but some of the kids I was, I was working with uh, getting up to the young teens, they were wanting to do um, physics uh, simulations. So they, they wanted to blow up a starship and make things explode and animate all bits and pieces. So we ended up doing things in uh, gaming, um, uh, gaming mechanics and all sorts of things up, up the higher end. So we, we were doing electronics, robotics, all sorts of things. Um, and, and my interaction with the Brisbane City Council Library is a fairly, um, uh, does not cross the, the velvet rope. They have a, a structure for volunteers, um, they hand over the resources and the keys to the library rooms and I go up to the velvet rope, take those resources and run those classes as I see fit. Um, so it's, it's very much a, a proper, uh, proper above the board interaction with Brisbane City Council Libraries. Um, I've had a um, much more recent and much more of a mishmash um, interaction with the State Library of Queensland. Um, and there's an area of the State Library of Queensland called The Edge. Um, and they, I'm not sure what they call themselves now, but they used to call themselves the Digital Cultural Centre. Um, and if you ask them to explain that, they can't. Um, but the idea of The Edge is that instead of, um, instead of providing resources, uh, to people, it would provide training to people. So um, they will run training courses in a whole heap of digital um, classes, all the way from programming up to music creation, uh, VR stuff, and they also do a lot of Fab Lab stuff. So they've got laser cutters, uh, proper like industrial 3D printers, um, industrial sized routers and things like that. So I'm making some furniture at the moment um, with them. Um, and I've run a number of workshops and events with The Edge over the years. Um, 
and mostly that resolves, revolves around programming, electronics and robotics. Um, so for me, um, my interaction with the State Library of Queensland is uh, much more of a, a mishmash because if they have an IT problem, they will come to me often um, and, and ask if there's a, a solution that they can deal with it locally rather than having to go to the IT group within the State Library because they know what response they'll get if they ask the library's IT help. Um, so there's much more uh, backwards and forwards with my interactions with the, the State Library of Queensland than with the Brisbane City Council Library. Um, so these two streams of my life do come together at a certain point in time, but we sort of have to go to a, a third um, uh, a third thread that I want to talk about before they all combine. Um, Software Carpentry is a worldwide group essentially looking to um, properly document all the software engineering things that researchers all around the world need to do so that their approach to creating software to solve their research problems uh, produces reliable results so that they can trust the data that they're um, publishing and also that they can go back in time and if they run the same program with the same input data, they'll get the same results um, and so that they can share that data in open publishing uh, formats. Um, it's a fairly formalised uh, process um, for teaching software carpentry. Um, they run a number of workshops over a number of days. They're in a, a fairly um, intensive workshop uh, boot camp style thing where people sit down for two, three, four days working on uh, computer fundamentals. Um, the idea is that researchers, no matter what domain uh, their research is in, will be able to get more work done um, with less frustration uh, they'll be able to uh, use computers as more of a tool rather than as a necessary evil and they'll be able to make um, more repeatable outputs and more reliable outputs of their research. Um, and the Software Carpentry Group, it's not an open source uh, exclusive um, organisation the vast bulk of their lessons are about open source um, tools, but they do give uh, lessons in some closed source tools as well. So there's official lessons for MATLAB, for example. Um, but going forwards, all of the material that Software Carpentry are making are Creative Commons. So there are a number of classes that they have for different tools that are not open source, but their lessons are open source or Creative Commons. Um, not to get too finicky about the licensing there. So the idea of software carpentry is that if you are using, if you're doing something in your professional life, you are using a computer to um, analyse uh, reams of data that your experiments have produced, you should be treating your use of computers as a professional problem. So software carpentry should be treated as a um, professional development uh, tool. So software carpentry runs its courses on site on the university in the workplace. It charges for the time that it takes to set up and organise them. Um, and it doesn't run them on the weekends. So it wants the organisations to realise that these are proper professional events um, that need to be taken seriously. Um, and as such, um, they're quite, um, that they have quite a good uh, code of conduct and they are quite um, reliant on that as well. Um, so, as a professional um, 
workshop. Um, there are a number of things that you have to do to um, be able to call yourself an official uh, software carpentry workshop. Um, so all of the lessons are Creative Commons. They're just sitting on their website. So you can go and um, uh, give your local GLAM Institute um, and run these workshops yourself. But to officially call yourself a, a software carpentry workshop, you have to give uh, three core lessons, and I'll go into those in a little. You have to have an official instructor. I am an official instructor. And one of the interesting aspects is that you have to give um, feedback and assessment for the carpentry classes. Um, there is a, uh, a training and a learning uh, pedagogy where the classes are constantly undergoing um, renewal and the feedback uh, from the clients is an important part of that. So this is probably where I'll start using technical gobbledygook, so um, drag me up on any of that. Uh, the three core lessons that must be taught at for a software carpentry class to be an official software carpentry class are something to do with automation. So instead of uh, dragging and dropping uh, 50 files that you want to copy um, over from one folder to another folder, we'll teach you how to do that same thing by typing commands into the Unix shell. So that's if you run uh, the terminal program on your computer, that's what you get. Uh, it has to include a structured programming course. Uh, structured programming is something where you um, get to think about programs in a, in a sense where the programs have a life cycle. Um, so something like Python or R or MATLAB where you can solve your problems, your problem today in writing a tiny little program, the Carpentry Workshops will get you thinking about solving that problem in a way so that in five years' time when you pick up that program to solve the same program problem again, it'll still work. Um, and version control. Version control is essentially a backup mechanism for your code and your data. And it means that if somebody asks you for the data that you used to um, create this graph in this paper from 15 years ago, if you've been using version control, you'll be able to get all of that data back. But at the same time, you'll be able to get the programs that you used to generate that graph and the data from your version control. So it is, version control is essentially a backup mechanism, but it's indexed on time. Um, so essentially, um, the work that I was doing in those research institutes and software carpentry are essentially the same thing. Software carpentry is essentially a codified form um, and a structured form of what I was doing at all of those research institutes, but put together in a, a, um, a solid uh, teaching uh, framework. Um, so if software carpentry was around at the start of my career, for the most part, I would have been able to take those software carpentry lessons, teach them at my uh, places of employment, and my job would essentially be done. Um, it was not, and I could not. Um, so software carpentry is a, uh, quite specific to, um, well, it's, it's generically for researchers across any domain that is using computing. There have been uh, some offshoots of software carpentry. So there's data carpentry for researchers who are generating a lot of data. So anyone in the genomics field, for example, is generating a lot of data. And the uh, storage and ret retrieval problems um, when you're dealing with a lot of uh, data there are particular techniques that you'd want to use for that. Um, and the data carpentry one is interesting uh, because they set up a parallel organizing structure to library carpentry. Um, and 
At the moment, library carpentry and data carpentry are merging into the one governing group. Um, there are subsets of classes that you can teach. So as for the most part, an actual um, software carpentry workshop will include those three core classes and another class that's closer to the domain of the researcher. So um, we will teach the three core classes and a biology workshop, for example. So it's got, we've got example data from the biology domain and you can, we can teach the three core classes of, um, of automation of uh, version control and structured programming using data from, for example, the biology domain, if that's where the researchers are at. And one of the offshoots of software carpentry is library carpentry. And I often say library carpentry, just to normalize the library and the carpentry. I <laughs> apologize for that. Um, so there are nine classes um, for uh, library carpentry at the moment. Uh, three of them are considered um, complete and finished to a certain degree and the rest of them are in um, beta and alpha states. So they've been given a few times, but they feel that the feedback that they've got on those classes means indicates that there's still some rough edges and they don't consider those um, done yet. Um, there have been 45 um, um, workshops, library carpentry workshops run. Um, and you can see where all of those workshops are run up on the website. So all the materials are up on the website in an open way. All of the workshops that have been run, all of the feedback that has been given is up there as well. So it is a very much um, an open design. Um, it's very similar to the, the keynote that I hope you all saw this morning where you put your successes up in a public way and you also put your failures up in a public way. Um, so there is already a thing called library carpentry, but when I look at the classes at, that are available for those workshops, um, to me, they don't really, um, trying to be diplomatic, they don't really cover the stuff that I see at the libraries that I interact with. Um, so uh, what, what a library is today, and, and this is um, a question that, that has more import in other parts of the world, um, like the UK at the moment, which is undergoing um, some interesting funding challenges for libraries. Um, but what a library does and what, uh, what does uh, what does a library even mean anymore, um, drastically changes the type of classes that you're going to be able to want to teach uh, for um, two librarians. Um, so the stuff that, that I'm involved with at the edge is robotics and electronics and teaching programming, um, designing um, 3D graphic objects to put into 3D printers, designing 3D objects, unpacking them so I can put them into a laser cutter, into a, into a 2D router. Those sort of classes are very different to um, the sort of informa information storage retrieval connections that a typical librarian would want to do. Um, so what I'm trying to think about at the moment is moving forwards into what um, librarians might be in a few years' time, and what classes could software carpentry uh, or library carpentry provide for them? So these are the classes that are currently available for library carpentry. Um, so you've got the Unix shell there. Um, so that's almost exactly the same class that we've got. So all of these are on the website as well. So you've got the Unix shell there, and that's almost exactly the same as the Software Carpentry um, Unix shell. So that's the automation core. Um, you've got introduction to data, which is library carpentry specific. And that introduces a 
little programming language called regular expressions, which lets you search for data in a certain way. And I think it would be fair to say that the software engineering types in the room might not be that comfortable with giving people um, reg the power of regular expressions to use with their data, because <laughs> it's just as easy to shoot yourself in the foot as it is to do something useful with them. Um, there's a lovely tool from Google called OpenRefine, which if you give it a spreadsheet of data, it will let you manipulate that data and normalize that data um, into one form. So if you are trying to um, connect the dots between different data sets, and all the different data sets, you know how it goes, they all have the same information, but they have different columns, they have different models. OpenRefine is a really nice tool that for the most part lets you normalize those different data sets into the same form so that you can connect the dots across them. And OpenRefine to me is a, a really good obvious class for library carpentry. Um, version control. Um, and it's, it's, version control is one of those really hard things. Version control is absolutely mandatory for any software engineer who's doing any problem today if they don't start off on day one by setting up version control so that all of their work is backed up and retrievable, um, you'd basically fire them. And we want everyone using computers to be using some form of version control. Unfortunately, the, the best technical solution to version control at the moment is Git. It is not designed for humans at all. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, like it's, it's, it's one of those things where at the moment um, you can't really suggest a different version control system than Git, um, even though its user interface um, is appalling. Um, it's just become the version control tool of choice across the entire open source industry, and to suggest something else would be kind of silly. Um, there is an SQL uh, class, so teaching you people how to um, uh, search their databases. So instead of having to rely on the web page interface to uh, people's databases, they can connect directly to their databases and they can understand the underlying structures of how their data is stored, um, which I think for certain classes of librarians, I think that's a very useful class. Um, web scraping is the notion of the World Wide Web having a lot of information on it, but in a lot of um, different formats. And the web scraping class teaches you how to uh, scrape data from websites. So get rid of all the colors, get rid of all the fancy animation, and just give me a table of the weather data, please. And it's, it's a very useful class for a certain subset of librarians. Um, there's a class on spreadsheets, on how to properly organize and design spreadsheets, which um, if anyone's done something serious with spreadsheets, that is a good thing. Uh, there is a uh, programming with Python class, and I'm a Python person, so it's a little bit hard for me to be um, objective about this, but I think that is a good introductory language to programming. If, if a librarian um, feels that they want to get into programming, Python's definitely a good, um, a good first place for that. Um, it's, it's a good language to learn programming with, but it is, it is also a full grade um, engineering language, so you can solve all of your problems with it. Um, and there is also a very alpha data intro for archivists lesson, and I haven't gone through that lesson yet, so I can't um, say too much about that one. Um, so the main reason for software carpentry is to be able to improve uh, researchers. We want um, drug researchers to have, uh, we want drug researchers to spend all of their time productively. We want them working on drugs that solve our medical problems. We don't want them sitting there banging their heads on um, computer problems. We want them to be able to produce uh, papers 
with a, a graph showing how, how effective a particular drug is, and we want them to be able to go back to their data, hit a big button, and reproduce those same data with the same graphs and the same response a year later. There's, we want um, researchers to be more productive and more reliable, um, and we want their science to be more repeatable. That's a, 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 it's a basic scientific um, underpinning that you publish your work and another researcher should be able to take that work and reproduce it. And the, the whole underlying point of software carpentry is that all of those code um, and data artifacts are published and made in such a way to improve that reproducibility. But a principle behind library carpentry, we have a very different, um, we have a very different role. Um, librarians connect people with information, they connect people with services. Um, so what should the principles behind library carpentry be? And I'm not at all saying that I'm, I'm the person to, to lay down these particular uh, principles. Um, but I think, um, I think library carpentry should be about professional development for librarians, which is why we need to hear from librarians about what classes they, they need to learn. And I think we need to be able to say that the classes that library carpentry offers helps the librarians, helps their patrons. I think those are the two um, underlying principles. Um, and I'm a software engineer, so it's very hard for me to think about the world in non-technical problem um, ways. Stop smoking, Donna. Um, <laughs> so I readily admit that I have a blind spot for dealing with these things. Um, I choose computer problems so that I don't have to deal with people problems. Librarians are dealing with people day in and day out. That is where their real problems lie. Um, so we already have a successful uh, library carpentry offshoot of software carpentry. And um, going into the future, it may be possible to think about having software carpentry for the other GLAM domains. Um, and you know, I'm only sort of partially in the library domain, so I, and I'm sort of struggling to think exactly what the classes we should be teaching for library carpentry are. I don't have a hope in heck of being able to think about what, what software practitioners in the other GLAM industries want to be taught. I have no idea. But it is definitely something that I want to know for the future. Um, and it's this sort of thing, do we go in a, do we, do we think about GLAM carpentry in a, a bottom-up process where we go to all of the practitioners and talk to them about what they want? Or do we do something top-down where we say, right, every GLAM carpentry workshop has to have these three or four things and we don't listen to the underlings who say that I'll never use that. And that is the end of my presentation. Um, so, questions, comments, ideas, suggestions for classes that people would like to learn? What happens when one of these environments is a Windows environment, one of your lessons is bringing in a Unix tool set? So, what happens when the environment that we're teaching is a non-Unix environment? So, this is definitely um, an issue. Um, software carpentry has is not just a set of classes, it is also a set of software with um, installers for a lot of the software that we work on to be easily installed. Um, so there is, there is the route where you can click, you can download a big glob thing for Windows and it will install Python and R and Git and everything for you. Um, it is becoming less of a problem now with Windows, it's got the um, Unix, um, uh, back end, and I've done a lot of really interesting things with that. I have not yet tried.
tried to teach the software carpentry class from that, but I have very little doubt that you could. Um, so Windows 10 has a feature where you can turn on a Unix environment in the back end, and then you've got a fully fledged Linux operating system on your Windows machine. And all of these Unix-like tools, you can very easily install on your Windows machine. Um, the other answer to that is that um, is the cloud. So for a lot of the stuff that I do now, um, I will try not to install stuff on people's machines, and I will try to get them to use um, coding notebooks um, in the cloud, so like a Jupyter notebook in the cloud. Um, I've trialled some other solutions where I have um, a little Raspberry Pi Unix computer, and I hand those out to everyone at the workshop, and that is their Unix server, and they are hooking up their Windows or Mac laptop to that, and they don't actually have to install any software themselves. So um, going forward, I think this is becoming actually less and less of a problem. Um, yeah. Um, anyone else? Any questions or comments? Um, yeah. So just setting aside the organisational cultural issues, um, I'm, I'm just interested in your comment about the list that's currently on my country not reflecting your experience at the edge and the prison city. And I'm wondering if that's sort of reflects a bit of a split between, I suspect the library carpentry stuff's come from more research library type people, and what you're doing is the programs in public libraries, which is a completely different world. So um, I guess I'm thinking like, it seems to me like there's probably nothing wrong with the list that's there at the moment, there's certainly some stuff there that I use in my library, but maybe it just needs to be a bigger. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. can kind of pick and yeah. pick yeah, and it's one of those things where I would like to get to a state where we can have, um, we can have like, like, two or three core classes that every library carpentry yeah. workshop teaches, and then have a smorgasbord of things that that they can teach on top of that. Um, and picking picking those is really hard, um, but yes, uh, uh, and and I would. G gladly take any feedback that you've got on particular classes that you would like to be added to that. That, that is very much part of the talk today. Any other questions? Yep. So I apologise if you've already um, said this and I missed it, but um, when you are putting together a curriculum, where can people help you make sure or contribute to that curriculum and like help make sure it's not missing anything? Is there a centralised resource where people with general tech knowledge can jump in yep. and help out? So all of the classes are up on GitHub. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably the best place to be able to add, ba um, add bugs or add feature requests yeah. up, up on GitHub. Um, there's also the idea that the people who are attending these classes before the class, they'll get handouts and they'll be asked, um, what do you hope to get out of these classes? And at the end, we ask them, you know, did you achieve what you wanted out of these classes? Did you get what you paid for? And um, uh, was there anything missing? Was there anything here that was irrelevant? So there's definitely, um, you can definitely do the open feedback model. And we're also um, at, the, at the client model, we're also doing that as well. So um, is it all in one GitHub org at this point? Um, yeah, so um, so the library carpentry stuff is mostly under, <laughs> yeah, I think all of the library carpentry stuff is underneath that GitHub, um, that GitHub page there. Um, so essentially in an effort to minimise the amount of web page work that they do, they basically use GitHub pages for everything. So, yeah. It's, it's a good website. Static sites are nicer than static sites for maintenance. Yep. yep. Um, I guess the ideal thing that I would, I, I as a person with a dev, uh, dev background who kind of likes teaching stuff, would, but is not in the right part of the world to actually necessarily show up to these workshops, would like to see is like a list of all the issues for we need curriculum help somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think if you go to. So that's basically going to. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's one of these things where 
because library carpentry is a little bit of an offshoot of software carpentry, there'll be some um, overlap between the issues on library carpentry GitHub and software carpentry GitHub. Anyone else? All right. Okay, thank you very much, everyone.